This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Radio, where each week we talk to a musician, artist, author, or other creative Mississippian working in the arts across the state. I'm your host, Melody Moody Thordes, Director of Grants at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today, I'm speaking with Max, Director of Arts Industry, Kristen Brandt. Kristen, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Well, we um, have gotten a chance to interview different members of the MAC staff over the years, and we have not had a chance to have you on the Arts Hour, so I'm so happy for people to get to know you more um, and what you do. So for those who don't know, why don't you introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about you? Sure. I'm from Mississippi. I was born in Flowood, and I grew up here, went to through high school and college uh, at Mississippi College in Clinton before I went to Kentucky for a few years for grad school. Um, I am very interested in literature and arts. That's what I have um, my degrees in. And I really just uh, love doing different things around the state that involve getting me into different communities and getting me uh, into different experiences that give me different perspectives of Mississippi. I've spent so much of my life in central Mississippi and working through with the Arts Commission has really given me a really big love and appreciation of the state as a whole. Well, we're going to talk a little bit later um, in depth about what you do at MAC, but why don't you give us a little overview of what arts industry even means? Sure. So for us at the Arts Commission, the Arts Industry Program refers to a group of organizations that are single discipline arts organizations. And by that, I mean they work with a focus on performing arts, whether that's a symphony, a ballet, or an opera. They might work with visual arts like our art museum in Jackson or the other ones across the state. We also have um, groups like Puppet Arts Theater or, uh, you know, other groups that fit into this program because they focus on a specific art form and providing access to that art form to Mississippians. Right. So I always think of arts industry like the arts institutions, you know, like, like you said, museums and symphonies and operas and orchestras and, you know, kind of the, the, um, the institutions of art that you think of. These are, um, so the, yes, the kind of more formal arts institutions. These are formal organizations that are uh, across the state. And these are arts-based organizations exclusively. Um, so we also... Uh, For those who may not know, we have different categories. So at MAC, we have arts-based community development. We have um, folk and traditional arts. We have arts education. And so um, arts industry is, is the final category. Okay, so Kristen, let's back up. Tell us, tell us a little bit more about um, growing up in central Mississippi. Um, so yeah, like Mississippi, yes, things change very slowly. So yeah. There are more houses and more people, but, you know, the, the culture and the, the story hasn't changed too much. Um, I grew up in Canton and went to uh, Madison County Schools. I participated in the, uh, the band throughout high school and really loved that, really loved being involved in the music um, programs that were available to me. And it gave me an appreciation for working in groups and working with, um, you know, collaboratively to do something that provides uh, joy and arts access to people across the state. And you played piano in high school, is that right? Yeah, I, yeah, I took piano lessons. But I was never really that great at it. I read sheet music, but I, I was much more um, focused on the clarinet in high school and picked up the saxophone for a little while because they're so similar um, in the fingerings. And uh, since I've left, I've also tried to pick up a couple other instruments like the ukulele. Um, it was quite a shock moving to a stringed instrument. 
it was a yes. my very big transition. Um, but I, I picked up strumming. It just took a long time. <laughs> I can understand that. My mom was actually a piano teacher. Um, and I had too small of hands, so I moved to drums. Um, so I had my piano teacher mother, and I played percussion, so I can completely understand that. Um, okay, so you grow, you're grow, you growing up, um, and then you end up in college at Mississippi College. And what did you study there? Uh, I studied English literature. Um, I actually ended up going to the same college as my twin, who ended up studying arts education, and uh, we, we followed similar paths, but uh, have enjoyed having that kind of close interest with her. Um, we so have your, your identical twin sister and you chose to go to the same college. We did. We were never roommates, though. Well, <laughs> at the college. Interesting. And uh, just, you know, kind of fun fact there. So did people, um, was that a? Did people get you confused with one another, or were you in such different studies that they didn't as much? Well, uh, we were in different departments. I was studying English in Jennings Hall, and she was in Avon studying arts education and fine arts. But I did spend three, um, three years at Mississippi College working in their ceramics lab, and I um, actually created an independent study that we called kiln firing and maintenance as an excuse to keep me around downstairs a little longer. Um, and we used to play tricks on our ceramics professor. <laughs> Wear so, those same color shirts and stuff like that, even though we weren't supposed to be in the labs at the same time. Of course. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, and we won't spend a lot of time on this, but I am interested in um, the time you spent doing ceramics, I know you still have a real interest in that. Um, is there anything you can tell me just like about what you enjoyed about ceramics or what you learned while you were there? Uh, yes, a lot of the coursework I did was focused on the wheel. I personally really loved hand building, so I did a lot of extra projects with that. Um, I think one of the biggest opportunities I had there, uh, was the fact that all of the classes were uh, split between different levels. So we would have Ceramics 1 students in with the Ceramics 3 students. And that's a little bit too much for one person to be able to handle for one class. So I got to get a lot more experience um, working on the wheel through teaching some of the intro students to do basic forms. Like, you really do learn a lot through teaching. <laughs> So we talked about um, some performing arts background and some visual arts background. So let's talk about grad school. Tell our uh, tell our listeners a little bit about your time at Western Kentucky and what you studied and learned there. Yes, as soon as I graduated from Mississippi College in Clinton, I packed up and moved to Bowling Green, Kentucky, where Western Kentucky University is located. I specifically sought them out because they have a rather excellent folk studies program. There's not many of those available. So uh, when I found one that I really connected with at WKU, I settled in quite quickly. I like to tell uh, my folklore professors that I spent four years giving English literature professors folklore degrees, uh, folklore papers, and then I spent my two years at WKU giving um, them literary papers. So <laughs> I think of myself rather interdisciplinary between the two because my focus at Western Kentucky was on folk narrative and storytelling. Yeah, tell me a little bit about, um, without going too deep, tell me a little bit about um, your thesis and your kind of specialty um, in narrative in, in folklore. Um, my thesis was on uh, a literary text, which we wouldn't necessarily consider a folk narrative in it of itself. It's something that's inspired by folklore. And I examined in my thesis Nathaniel Hawthorne's Wonder Book for Girls and Boys, which is a retelling of six Greek myths in a uniquely American context. And I examined the ways in which the retelling of those stories in a new context um, 
<clears throat> emphasize certain beliefs about uh, children and childhood because in writing in the early 19th century, this is right about the time where we're getting the emerging genre of children's literature, which has not always been a part of the literary canon. So this wow. is looking at ideas about childhood and children's literature and uh, what it means to raise a good American child. So before you found your way to Mac, what was your intent um, in, in studying this particular facet of folk studies? Um, I had intended on going on for a PhD, which I might still do in the future, um, that would enable me to teach at college. I was a teaching and research assistant when I was in grad school, and I loved working with undergraduates. I loved the passion and all the ideas that they had, and I loved being able to foster that, and I didn't mind grading papers. <laughs> um, well, I'm just thinking about your time at Western Kentucky, tell me about some of the field work you did with the National Park Service. We were talking about that earlier, and I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about that. Yes, yeah, so um, Bowling Green, and which is where Western Kentucky University is located, is uh, very different geolog geographically from here. It's um, very hilly, and it's full of caves, and there is a national park just outside of Bowling Green called Mammoth Cave National Park, which is one of the largest cave systems in the world. And uh, each national park actually does an ethnographic survey, which is a study of the folklore of the communities and counties surrounding that park. So the park can determine the best way to serve those communities and also the best way to create access for points of communal significance within the park boundaries, since these were not always national parks. So, for example, at uh, Mammoth Cave, there's a lot of family and community cemeteries, which are now on national park land, but the Park Service does work with the communities to provide access for their homecomings and grave decorations. So what we did was go around in the surrounding communities and identify structures which might be eligible for the National Register of Historic Places and conduct interviews with individuals in communities that would be of interest to the park. And then also prior to Mac, you worked briefly at the Mississippi Museum of Art. What did you do there? I worked with Julian Rankin on the Picturing Mississippi Land of Plenty, Pain, and Promise um, and the Bicentennial apps for the Museum of Art. When you go into the museum, you can actually download an app that'll play recordings of experts that have um, commented on the works for these past exhibits, and I helped record the audio for those um, for those apps and helped do some photo documentation as well. Hi, I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. No matter if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone, Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology for tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Radio. Each week on the Arts Hour, representatives from the Mississippi Arts Commission speak with different creative Mississippians. Today, I have the pleasure to speak with Max Arts Industry Director, Kristen Brandt. So, Kristen, before the break, we were talking a little bit about your background. Um, and I wanted to now talk about your position at Mac and what you do. So before you were arts industry, you actually started at Mac as an intern. Is that right? When, when was that? So my second year of grad school, I decided that instead of choosing between an internship requirement and a thesis requirement to complete my degree, I would do both. 
Mm -hmm. And um, I needed to get an internship and decided to reach out to any WKU alumni that were in Mississippi. And one of my professors directed me to the Arts Commission because they had not one but two WKU alumni working there at the time. And that was um, Jennifer Joy Jamison, our Folk and Traditional Arts Director, uh, our former Folk and Traditional Arts Director, and Larry Morrissey, who is our current Deputy Director. So I reached out to Jennifer and told her I was at WKU and looking for some work while I was at home for the summer and for any breaks. And she wrote back saying, I don't need an intern, but I do need a contractor. So I, uh, I took that as a best case scenario. How often do you get a paid internship? <laughs> exactly. So then you started working at Mac as, an, as a contractor, and then you, you helped digitize the, the folk um, logs. Tell me a little bit more about what you did. So when I came in, we had a large folk arts archive of audiovisual materials that have been collected since the early 80s. So these were 35 millimeter slides, um, film, uh, lots of different types of uh, video formatting that nobody today would recognize. Um, so I mostly spent all of that summer going through each and every slide and identifying what was on it for a index and then digitizing a select number of those images um, based on what publications and need we had at the time. So I, I cataloged uh, about five to 6,000 items and then digitized probably another thousand more. Wow, okay. And then after that, you moved um, to another position. You, um, were briefly the uh, administrative assistant, but then you moved into special initiatives. So tell me a little bit about some of the work you did as the special initiatives director at MAC. Sure. One of the first programs that I got involved in when I came as special initiatives director uh, was doing visual arts exhibit exhibitions of artists who had received visual artist fellowships from us in prior years and the visual artist fellowship is an award of excellence that the arts commission gives uh, it's an up to five thousand dollar award and those artists are recognized as um, some of the most talented or technically skilled in their area and i worked with probably 15 to 18 artists doing exhibits over the 10 month period when I first became special initiatives director. I worked with a contractor, Teresa Haygood, who's a mosaic artist here. Uh, she's wonderful and was a pleasure to work with. And, and also really... a former MAC um, employee. Yes, she was also a former special initiatives director. So uh, we come back and we also don't go away. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I got to know so many artists across the state through that program, and I also got to know the Mississippi Library Commission, which I hadn't realized was such a wonderful resource right here next next to MPB. And beautiful. If no one has been to the, if any listeners out there have not been to the Mississippi Library Commission, it is a beautiful building designed by Duval Decker Architects. Um, when I briefly worked there, so I, I learned a lot about it, but it's got some beautiful stained glass from Pearl River Glass Studio, um, and that's just, you know, it's facade, it's, it's in, in it's, it houses uh, so many different wonderful collections as well. Um, okay, so talk to me about arts industry a little bit more. So we talked about how it's um, these other arts institutions, at MAC, a lot of those receive operating grants. So let's talk about grants. Let's put on our grants hat for just a minute. And let's talk about kind of the grants that you manage and the types of organizations that can apply to MAC for the grants within the arts industry area. Sure. We have two different um, 
programs during our annual grant round in addition to our many grants that organizations can apply for. For the organizational operating grants, project grants, or the mini grant. For an operating grant, you have to be an arts-based organization in operation for more than two years. And you also have to be a 501c3 nonprofit in order to apply. You can apply for up to 25%, I believe, Melody, of mm -hmm. your annual operating budget in the operating grants category. And uh, it serves a lot of our larger arts institutions in the state. You use that type of funding for your operating expenses like staff salaries, utilities, facility rent, whatever you use to keep the doors open. Right, so operating grants at MAC are made eligible to arts-focused organizations. Um, they have to have arts as the, the primary piece of their mission uh, to be eligible. So that's a big piece of arts industry. Um, and then what about project grants? Project grants um, in my program area are for the most part also from organizations whose primary mission is the arts, but also universities or uh, different larger institutions across the state that are doing a single discipline arts project. So for example, uh, we have funded the Mississippi University for Women Music by Women Festival or the Alcorn State University Jazz Festival, the Charles H. Templeton Jazz Festival at Mississippi State University. So we fund through the project grants an arts specific project. Um, it can be a performance, it can be a workshop or a conference. The Mississippi Writers Guild hosts an annual conference every July using one of our project grants. Um, so they're, they're a lot more open for uh, a specific event rather than for the general operating of an organization. And it's, it, it's very open as, as far as the imagination can have you plan a project that's effective and serves your community. Um, we're interested in hearing what you have to propose. So for those out there who may not be familiar with the MAX project grants, uh, both the project grants and the operating grants are due every year in March. So the grants we're talking about are not available now, but will be open in March of 2021. And the project grants are matching. So that would be an organization puts up half of what they are applying for up to $5,000 to do um, to propose a project within our confines and scope. Um, you also helped manage um, the tail end of some other grants um, without us going into deep detail about those. Um, you know, you did the building funds for the arts. So that's just something that Mac has offered in the past. If you want to just touch on that. Sure. These are large capital expenditure grants that um, arts organizations in the arts industry category received to do facility expansions, to do needed maintenance, or to uh, do specific acquisitions. We've also um, helped push through the DIL fund for the arts, which uh, was an endowment that we received to help arts institutions and organizations purchase works of seascape or landscape. Um, paintings. So those grants are no longer currently available through MAC, but is something that we've done over the years and you've been a part of. Now I'm going to talk about something that you also manage at MAC, but you're um, also very passionate about, which is literary artists. So similar to the way that we break up our grants by type of organization, we also break up our grants to individuals by type of artist. So we have program directors who focus on folk and traditional artists. We have others who focus on performing artists and, um, and visual artists. And you, Kristen, focus on literary artists. So for those out there who may say, well, I'm a literary artist and I've never received a, a grant from MAC, what is there for me and what types of literary artists does MAC support? 
Sure, we support uh, literary artists in a lot of different genres and endeavors. Uh, one program that we sponsor for our literary artist is the Literary Artist Fellowship, which is an award of up to $5,000, similar to that Visual Artist Fellowship that I mentioned earlier. It recognizes your artistic excellence and is judged by a blind panel of judges. So that means that the group that is reviewing your application does not know your identity when the application is reviewed. So having a lot of books published isn't necessarily going to be a leg up in this type of application. It's meant to be something that is equal and meant to be judged based on the work itself. We alternate that program every other year. This past uh, few, the past few weeks we've announced our 2021 fellowship recipients and those were people who had applied in the fiction and poetry categories this year we'll be accepting applications in nonfiction, screenwriting and playwriting so nonfiction, screenwriting and playwriting will be accepted in march of 2021 and that'll be for fellowships which we're really looking for merit-based very high caliber uh, in their field. Yes, these are our most competitive grant and partially because there's a good deal of interpretation for how you're allowed to spend this. Most grants you apply specifically to do a project or to fund a specific um, endeavor, but for the fellowship this is an award of excellence and the funding should be used uh, however best judged by the applicant to allow them to create more work. Right, and grow in their and grow in their um, their process. So, um, in the literary field, you also have been um, managing the effort for the poet laureate in Mississippi. Tell our listeners how that process works and what you've what you've done to kind of help move that forward. The uh, the governor of Mississippi at the time um, endowed the arts commission with the authority to uh, run the selection process for the Mississippi Poet Laureate pr uh, position. The Arts Commission is not the only member of that committee. Uh, there are a lot of cultural institutions that are involved in the process. We just are the recipient of the applications and we help uh, these organizations come together and we provide our own input um, to come to a group of nominations, a uh, group of individuals who have been nominated um, to interview and submit to the governor for him to select. So throughout uh, the year we ha accept nominations for the Poet Laureate in a year where we will be changing. It's an every four years position. Um, so once those nominations have been received, the Arts Commission then uh, processes and hosts a meeting where we interview potential candidates. So the Poet Laureate prior to Natasha Trethewey was a lifelong post. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and then after that, it became a every four year position. So when, um, when Beth Ann Finley became our Poet Laureate, uh, her term was to actually end in this August, but with everything going on, we have asked her to extend her tenure and she graciously accepted. This worked out quite excellent, uh, excellently because when she was nominated and uh, asked to become the Poet Laureate, she was actually on a semester away with students. So she wasn't able to serve her first six months. So we've been able to get an extra little bit of time where we are able to enjoy that service and it, i apologize if you said this already but when are nominations already closed for the next round nominations are not closed you can still submit a nomination and we will be um put, uh, announcing the deadline for poet laureate uh, nominations closer to uh, when that'll be happening uh, 
where were where would people send a nomination for the poet laureate if they wanted to do that hearing this after hearing this interview? We have a link on the Mississippi Arts Commission website. That's arts a r t s dot m s dot gov. You can search for our poet laureate page, and then there's a link to our online nomination form. It does ask that you get some letters of recommendation, so you would have to work in partnership with at least uh, two other people to be able to submit the nomination. But uh, if you have any questions, I welcome you to reach out and I'd love to discuss. Hi, I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Radio. Each week on the Arts Hour, representatives from the Mississippi Arts Commission speak with different creative people living in Mississippi. Today, I'm speaking with Max, Director of Arts Industry, Kristen Brandt. Um, so, Kristen, I want to talk a little bit about some of the projects that you manage at Grant at Mac, in addition to grants. Um, so, um, people may have heard about the Mississippi Writers Trail, but may not know exactly what it is. So, that's a project that you are heading up along with um, Malcolm White, and I help out a little bit as well. But tell our listeners what the Writers Trail is, how it started, um, and you know the process that that happens with the Mississippi Writers Trail? So the Mississippi Writers Trail is a series of historical markers that celebrate the literary, social, historical, and cultural contributions of Mississippi's writers. We have an advisory committee comprised of cultural agencies across the state that oversee our process of installing the markers. And we, want to emphasize the literary focus of this trail so all of the markers are shaped like an open book and they display information about the author's life and about the location which the marker is placed and we hoped that this uh, will be able to educate the public about the legacy of Mississippi writers. It was a passion project of our executive director Malcolm White who uh, felt this was a long overdue uh, program to honor these wonderful storytellers who have really captured Mississippi in ways that nobody else could. So you talk about historical markers. I know that um, MDA um, and Department of Tourism does the blues marker. So people may be familiar with those throughout the state. So this is a similar process, but really focusing on um, the literary uh, authors um, in Mississippi. So we started the Writer's Trail in 2018, so we said? Yes, 2018. And uh, we, we put... Yep. Go ahead. Sorry, we put, we put the Eudora Welty marker in at the 2018 Mississippi Book Festival. So we started and with we also Eudora unveil... Welty. Yes, we were... So we were funded for that from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And that covered how many markers? Uh, It covered about 10. Uh Uh-huh. About 10 markers surrounded by the NEH. Um, We did Eudora Welty. Tell me about that first group of markers, some of the people that that included. 
So that included uh, Eudora Welty, Ida B. Wells, William Faulkner, Margaret Walker, Alexander, and Elizabeth Spencer, who I got to speak with um, before her marker was installed. And uh, she was such a lovely person to get to know. And shortly after we installed her marker, she uh, she passed. So to be able to have that contact with her and uh, send her different uh, photos from the unveiling and show her exactly how many people came out to support the work that she did in her hometown. Uh, I think it really meant a lot to her. And then tell our listeners a little bit about the the process with our literary scholars. So we have a committee of scholars who specialize in uh, literature, Southern literature, who propose writers to be included in the trail, who draft the text for each marker, and they also make recommendations for placement. We also consult with any living family or living authors on the text and the placement of these markers. That's very important to us that the community and the families have input. So um, I know that we have also had some markers funded privately um, that we're, we're working on as well. And then we received a grant recently to do a set of writer's trail markers in the Delta. Um, Tell me about that process. Yes, we received about $20,000 from the Mississippi Delta National Heritage Area, and we have started to receive community matches from counties and cities where these markers will be placed. Uh, We work with our partner at Visit Mississippi, the state tourism agency, to identify members in each community who might be able to uh, facilitate getting a match for each marker because we uh, at the Arts Commission have uh, received funding that requires us to have a community match. So we, once we have that match in hand, can go ahead and place an order with our foundry who casts these uh, physical markers uh, and then ships them directly to the installation uh, location since they're so heavy. (laughs) So to be clear, the Mississippi Writers Trail, it commemorates um, with historical markers these authors that have made a significant contribution, but the scholars themselves are who make the recommendations for who is included in these markers. Um, and then we get input from the family and support from the community. Is there anything else you'd like to add kind of about the Writer's Trail or maybe tell us why you um, are passionate about or what you like about working on it? So, you know, my background is in English literature. My, uh, my special love is folklore and storytelling, and my emphasis in studying literature was Southern literature. I um, had a special love for Flannery O'Connor, and I have really enjoyed getting to be able to recognize all of the these writers of merit and be able to get to know people I was not originally familiar with. We are working with writers across genres, so these aren't just fiction writers. These are our screenwriters, our playwriters, our journalists, our food writers. Um, we'll be working with a large variety of different types of storytelling with this trail. Um, so tell us about another project that, that you help manage, um, our artist roster. We, all of our program staff that deals with grants work um, in different genres with our artist roster, but you kind of oversee the roster as a whole. Um, and our arts education director oversees the teaching artist roster. So to differentiate that, tell us a little bit about what Max artist roster is and how it works. So the Mississippi artist roster is a listing of adjudicated performers, creators, and writers um, of all genres that apply to be included. They are listed on our website, which we uh, described earlier in the show. Um, 
you apply during our annual grant round and members of the roster receive certain benefits like being eligible to be hired through our mini grants program. So organizations can hire members of our roster um, through our mini grants where we will pay for half of the cost to hire that artist up to $1,000. So, so that involves, um, you know, commissions for, you know, physical uh, public art pieces. It could be a speaking engagement or a performance. So a lot of questions we get for people who want to be on the artist roster is some people think it's a listing. So it's, it's not just uh, put your name on this list and it's not a grant because it doesn't come with a financial award. But it is... Um, an adjudicated roster that has been where the work has been looked at by a panel of experts, right? So can you speak a little bit about that and how that differs from just simply a list or simply a grant? Absolutely. Our roster application, uh, partially, uh, Allow, it's partially the submission of what would be on your roster artist page if you're approved to join the roster. So some of it is uh, being able to describe yourself and what you want to offer. And then also the other half of this is your work samples. So depending on what art form you specialize in, you might have to submit uh, audio or video of you performing, a certain number of photo samples of work that you've created, or a certain number of pages that you've written. Uh, like our grant applications, these are all processed through our online system. So you would go online and fill out an application. Uh, your application would be reviewed, like Melody said, by a panel of judges who would score your application and then they make recommendations for whether or not um, they would recommend our board of directors approve them for their inclusion in the roster because our board of directors makes final say in all of our grant and programming decisions. That's great, uh, great, great job, Kristen. That's um, I hope that that helps explain the artist roster. And again, for those listening who may whose ears may have perked up, they might be interested. That is also opens up in March of 2021. So we are giving you guys the heads up about a lot of these grants and programs uh, that Mac offers. So something else, Kristen, as we as we start to wrap up our conversation, is you know we are all living in the age of COVID-19. And arts, artists and arts organizations have uh, some unique challenges in, um, in, in the emergency prep uh, world. Um, you've done some work in uh, learning more about emergency prep for artists and arts organizations uh, in order to be a, a resource to those in Mississippi. Can you tell us a little bit about... Um, what you've what you've learned and what you've been able to to do in that realm absolutely uh so mac has had a institutional history of being involved in emergency response if you uh were, we're pretty well known in the arts com preparedness community for our katrina response grants and initiatives so because of that I was invited to participate in an emergency preparedness graduate course offered through the University of Kentucky and I participated in that luckily uh, during uh, January and February of 2020 so just in time to get some uh, knowledge under my uh, not knowledge before all of this happened um, and you know it's been so long but you know uh, before coronavirus, we had floods with the Pearl River, and we we were on on our toes, ready to respond if we had artists who experienced any kind of loss from that, and we were lucky there. But uh, we have had a lot of programs and grants running since the coronavirus pandemic has impacted all of the arts events and programming across the state. So after that course concluded, I, I, I started working on different emergency grants that we were able to push out over the last few weeks. And Melody uh, 
can definitely say that we've worked very hard over the past, you know, March to July to fund as many uh, emergency grants as possible for a vast uh, variety of different levels of artists and organizations. That's right. So Kristen has been a, a huge part of that, um, along with the rest of our grant staff. Uh, we have been able, Mac has been able to disperse uh, emergency funding from the CARES Act passed um, by Congress, and we have been able to work as hard as we can to get that money into the hands of artists and arts organizations, um, along with as much artist art relief that we have been able to do. We hope to do more later this year, but we are just wrapping up our third um, COVID-related grant, um, and um, Kristen is helping to manage those efforts um, as well. So, Kristen, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find out more about um, emergency um, emergency resources in uh, for any artists and arts organizations out there dealing with COVID-19? Well, I have created a resource library on the Arts Commission website. If you look on our emergency preparedness page, there's a list of resources for both artists and arts organizations. Uh, there are some really great national organizations that I would recommend you connect with. If you're an individual artist, Surf Plus, the Artist Safety Net, uh, has some excellent resources, particularly for hurricane preparedness, which again is another thing that's on our minds right now. And we're also hoping during our state arts conference this October to be offering a panel on emergency preparedness for those who have an interest in learning more about this. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app.